uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers. Where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union, right? And they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the, whole, the, the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an, R, R, an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is given me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, anytime you have money in your, in your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do, what everything, you sell. Everything is in there, you know? And so they, they want a one-world government controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people, and you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. Eric, can you be specific about when you met Rockefeller, how it happened in these discussions? I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew who called me up one day and said, uh, one of the Rockefellers would like to meet you. I had made a video called Mad as Hell, and uh, he'd seen the video and wanted to meet me and knew I was running for governor of Nevada. So sure, I'd love to meet him. And I met him, and I liked him, and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man. And uh, we used to talk and share ideas and thoughts. And um, he's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event. Never told him what the event was going to be. But there was going to be an event. And out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We were going to invade Iraq, you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East, and make it all part of the New World Order. And we'd go after Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, sure enough, later 9-11 happened. And I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're going to see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places. And, it's, and there's going to be this war on terror, uh, which is no real enemy. And the whole thing is a giant hoax, you know, but it's a way for the government to take over the American people. He told you it was going to be a hoax. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question. He says, there's going to be war on terror. And he's laughing. There's no... <laughs> Who are we fighting? I mean, why do you think 9-11 happened and then nothing's happened since then? Do you think that our security is so great here that these people who pulled off 9-11, who were able to, can't knock down another plane? Come on, it's ridiculous. 9-11 was done by people in our own government and our own banking system to perpetuate the fear of the American people and to subordinating themselves to anything the government wants them to do. That's what it's about, and to create this, war, this endless war on terror. And, that's why we, and that was the first lie. And the next lie was going into Iraq, you know, uh, to uh, get Saddam Hussein out with his weapons of mass destruction. That was the next lie. Now, now specifically, this was a little over six years ago? This was... Uh, 11 months before 9-11. Yeah. And Nick Rockefeller, he's a lawyer, he is, he, he's become your friend over the previous years, and he's saying to you that there's going to be this big event and then out of that we're going to have a war on terror and it's just going to go on and on. Right. An endless war on terror without, without any real enemy. That you can never, so you can never define a winner. And, and uh, did he say that it's going to be perfect because you can't define an enemy and it just goes yeah. on and on? Yeah, because you can't define a winner. There's no one who's going to beat, so it goes on and on forever. And they can do whatever they want. They scare the hell out of the American public. Look, this whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. It's very difficult to say it out loud because people are intimidated against saying it.
Because if you say it, they want to make you into a nutcase. Let's but, the truth, but the truth has to be, the truth has to come out. That's why I'm doing this interview. The fact of the matter happens to be that the whole war on terror is a fraud, it's a farce. Yet yeah, there's a war going on in Iraq, because we invaded Iraq. And people over there fighting, you know. But the war on terror, it's a joke, you know. And until we discover what really happened on 9-11, and who was responsible for 9-11, because that's where the war on terror emanates from. That's where it comes from. It was 9-11 that allowed this war on terror to begin. And until we get to the bottom root of 9-11, the truth of 9-11, we'll never know about the war on terror. Aaron, you said that he was, and I think it's important, and I know this about the Rockefellers from Dr. Dennis Cuddy and many others, who literally, he'll be 20 years old in a lunch line at college, and no, there's David Rockefeller. And he hears here, I mean, they're experts at recruiting and getting what they call players, and that clearly he was, I mean, I want to make it specific and just get you to reiterate what you said last night uh, about you were, you got 30% of the vote, you were having an effect, you, you, you made mad as hell, they knew that you'd started the Constitution Party, yeah. they knew that you were uh, somebody who was taking action and getting things done, you'd already made some big films, had a lot of other successes, right. so they were trying to recruit you and, and, and didn't it come down to the point of, hey, we are here to recruit you and don't worry, your chip's going to say, don't mess with us, you know, this guy's uh, don't touch. Yeah, yes, that did happen. Now, I was definitely being recruited, but it's more subtle than that. Well, in your words, just go through the process, and then, and then what do you say? Well, well, what it is is, I remember, we were friends, and we used to have, he used to go to my house a lot, we'd have dinner, we'd talk, and he'd, he'd tell me about business investments that he'd get involved in, you know, or they would help me with this business investment or that business investment. And was I interested in joining the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, I would have to get a letter to join them. But was I interested in that? And uh, you know, just uh, just stuff. You know, leading you on. And, and uh, I, I used to say to him that I never really did that because well, that wasn't where I was coming from. You know, as much as I like you, Nick, you know, your ways and my ways were, the, uh, were on the opposite side of the fence. You know, I don't believe in enslaving people. You know, and. Um, and he would come back with, oh, I do? Or? Well, it would be more like, you it's know... It's better for them. Well, it's more like, you know, um, how do I put it? It was like, what do you care about them? What do you care about those people? What difference does it make to you? Take care of your own life. Do the best you can for you and your family. What do the rest of the people mean to you? They don't mean anything to you. They're just serves. They're just people. You know, it was it was just a lack of caring, you know, and that's just not who I was. It was just sort of like cold, you know. It was just like cold, you know. And uh, I used to say to him, what, what's the point of all this? You have all the money in the world you need. You have all the power you need. What's the point? You know, what's the end goal? And he said the end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society. To have, the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor controlling the world. What, and, and, and I said, all, do all the people in the Council on Foreign Relations believe this way you do? He said, no, no, no. You know, it, it, most of them believe they're doing the right thing. A lot of them believe it's better, it's better off being socialistic. You know, we have to convince people that capitalism, that socialism is really capitalism. Because America's becoming a socialist country. It's a communist country today. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he brought, we were, he's at the house one night, and uh, we were talking, he would talk, and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He said, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before Women's Lib. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up the family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. 
And so those are the two prim- the primary reasons for women's love, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure.